Welcome to the LACO uh, State and Federal Programs meeting, directors meeting. Today, I am joined by the LCAP State and Federal Programs unit team. I'm Adrian Balcazar, and I'd like to introduce the rest of the team that's here today. We have Augustine Garcia, Jeannie Keith, Rachel Garcia, Anita Lomali, and Debbie Cano. I'd also like to introduce our support staff, Maribel Leva. We'd also like to welcome the Accountability and Data Literacy Unit. Evan Bartelheim and Hilary Weissman will be presenting with us today. The topics for today's agenda include local indicators, reminder, consolidated application, FPM uh, update, the LCAP update, looking specifically at the required metrics for LEA-wide actions, and also most effective use of funds. And then we will end with um, the uh, metrics and some clarification on colors, uh, the reds in the dashboard. So um, we'll get started. As you know, uh, we use, as usual, please place your questions in the chat box and we will answer any simple questions that we can. And then we'll follow up with the written responses in a Q&A that will be emailed to you, uh, letting you know that we are recording today's training and we will post this on our Canvas webpage. You can also find the Q&As as well as the slides and any handouts from our previous meetings at this link. And so now, Debbie will start us off with some reminders on the local indicators. Great, thank you, Adrian. Good morning, everybody. So we are just starting out with a reminder about the local indicators. And for those of you who know this and already have done this, or you've done this a few times already, we apologize, but we know that there are always new folks in our audience. We just wanna make sure that we uh, bring home this information. Next slide. So the local indicators refer to the state priorities that don't have state level data, such as academic achievement and CAST, that state level data that we have. So basic services, um, the implementation of state standards, school climate, these priorities that you see listed here on the, um, the slide are considered local indicators. And next slide, LEAs are asked to use the state provided self reflection tool to measure and report their progress within the appropriate priority areas. And you can see the CDE link on the slide there. And this is a, a link to the guide and the tools that support the self reflection um, process that L each LEA must um, engage in each year. Next slide. <clears throat> And so the requirements for the local indicators are as follows. So each LEA will annually measure its progress in meeting the requirements for the specific LCFF priorities. So you are gonna use those tools that we mentioned on the previous slide and you're going to use go through that self-reflection process. And then you're going to report those results as part of a non-consent item at the same public meeting of your board that where you, the LCAP and your budget are adopted. So at that same meeting, you're going to present this information, your findings on the local indicators. And then lastly, you're gonna report those results to the public through the dashboard using the state, the, uh, the reflection tools and the local indicators. So you're gonna upload that information um, to the CDE and that will be reported through the dashboard as either met or not met. If you don't, follow those three steps, you're not going to receive a MET. You do, that's a MET. It's not talking about your progress in each of those areas. It's just, did you follow these three steps? Yes, you met the, the, um, the, the uh, objective for those. Next slide, please. And here is just a timeline for you to make sure that you uh, follow the process. So now, uh, you're going to be gathering and analyzing that data using the information, the tools on or before July 1st. You're getting your, you're now you're gearing up to report that information with your plan and your budget. And then after that in the summer, 
when the dashboard opens and the new dashboard coordinators are assigned, they will have access to upload the local indicators to the dashboard. And now I'm going to hand it over to Rachel. Thank you, Debbie. Good morning, everyone. Um, so in this next section, we just have a brief update on the Consolidated Application Reporting System, otherwise known as CARS. So the 2024-25 Consolidated Application and Reporting System Spring Release is scheduled to open on Wednesday, May 1st. And the initial certification deadline is June 30th at 1159 p.m. The forms will remain open after that June 30th deadline to allow LEAs to make any corrections that might be needed. And then the final close date for the spring data collection forms will be August 15th, 2024 at 11.59 p.m. And so keep in mind that the CDE has indicated that the forms will not be reopened after that final close date. So here, this slide highlights the data collection forms that will be included in the 2024-25 spring release. And so here you can see that it includes data collection for three years. So for the 2022-23 year, 2023-24, and then 2024-25. And so most of the data collection forms listed will close on August 15th. However, CDE has indicated that several of the 2024-25 forms will stay open longer. And so those forms are noted on this slide with an asterisk. So here we just wanted to share a few reminders regarding the 2024-25 Application for Funding Data Collection Form. And so this is the form where LEAs will need to indicate the federal programs that they are requesting to participate in for 2024-25. And keep in mind that only those federal programs that the LEA is eligible to receive funding for will be displayed on the form. Also remember that the application for funding requires board approval. So the form will ask that the LEA certify that the local governing board has approved the LEA's application for funding for that specific fiscal year. And additionally, when completing this form, LEAs will need to certify that parent input has been received from the District English Learner Committee regarding the spending of Title III funds for that specific year. And so for your reference, we've included a sample board item executive summary with today's materials. And so feel free to adapt this sample to meet your LEA's needs for board approval of the application for funding. So for your reference, we've also included here the tentative timeline for the 2024-25 CARS winter release. And so CDE has indicated that the 24-25 winter release is scheduled to open on December 1st, 2024, with an initial certification deadline of January 15th, 2025, and a final close date of February 15th, 2025. And so keep in mind that these dates are tentative and are subject to change. And so here we've just included a few CDE resources related to the CONAP. And so the first is the CDE CONAP webpage, which includes links to several resources, including the CARS data entry instructions, the legal assurances, CARS news flash updates, and also the CARS data release schedule. Um, this is also where you'll be able to access the instructions for the 2024-25 spring release once those are posted. And then the second link we've included is the registration link for the CDE Title II Technical Assistance webinar on the CARS spring release. And so at this webinar, CDE staff will discuss the Title II Part A forms included in the spring release. And then lastly, we've included um, the email to su subscribe to the CDE's CONAP listserv if you have not yet done so. 
And so that concludes this section. I will now turn it over to Adrian for an FPM update. Thank you, Rachel. So federal program monitoring update. So as we know, next year's FPM cycles that are up for review are cycle A, which are online reviews, and cycle C, which is which are on-site reviews. And on CDE's compliance monitoring webpage, you will find the posted list of districts and charter schools who have been selected for next year's FPM reviews. Last week, these 20 districts and charter schools were notified of their selection for the FPM review for the 24-25 school year. Last year, there were 18 districts and charter schools, so they are increasing it again. Uh, previously, due to staffing at CDE, it kind of um, they lessened the numbers, but it looks like things are stabilizing, so they will be increasing, you know, in the future um, back to I guess the number that it used to be. So um, you can take a look here, and in case you didn't know, you can take a look and see if your district or charter school was selected, or perhaps you might be <laughs> breathing a sigh of relief, but then knowing perhaps your neighbors you know, might need your help. Uh, so again, just um, take a look, and you can see this is for the online and the on-site reviews. If we look at the timeline for next year's 24-25 FPM reviews, uh, in April is usually when CD selects the district and charter schools who will have an FPM review. So on, on April 15th, the district superintendents and charter schools were sent an email. And in this email, the CDE asked for the LEA to complete a web-based scheduling and information request. So here you will state who is the designated FPM review coordinator for the FPM review. You'll also include other information such as the calendar for next year so that CDE can coordinate the dates of the reviews for next year. The sooner that all 20 districts and charters submit the survey, the sooner CDE will be able to do the scheduling and let the selected LEAs know what the dates are, what sites, what programs will be reviewed. So CDE shared that most likely in the last week of May, the schedule of dates, schools, and programs to be reviewed will be emailed to the LEA's FPM review coordinator. So that's why it's important that you fill out that survey because that person will be receiving the uh, review details. And then in June, uh, CDE said you can expect to see the 24-25 FPM instruments to be posted on the CDE compliance monitoring website. Once the instruments are posted, you can begin informing and training the staff that's responsible for the implementation of the programs and the collection of the evidence that you will need to support to CDE. Then what happens next is the CDE virtual FPM training, which this year will start on Wednesday, July 31st through Tuesday, August 6th. So they're um, spreading it out over more days. And I think that's based on feedback that they've received from the past prior years of feedback on the, um, the three-day training and sometimes the four-day training. So they're, they're, they're spreading it out. So you'll want to invite, if you are selected, you will want to invite all your district and site level staff to this virtual training. Um, we usually get questions about what if you're not being reviewed, can you attend this training? And yes, you can. Although they ask that you send our office, um, your name and your interest, and we'll keep a list. And so usually in the beginning parts of July, they'll send out the links um, to the various um, sessions. So then we can um, forward that information to you as well. So you're not excluded, but the way that districts are informed about it is to the FPM coordinator. So we will be happy to be that liaison for any of you that are not um, being reviewed, but would like to attend. So um, for those of you that are being reviewed, based on the date of your FPM review, you will want to backwards plan and ensure that you're going to meet the deadline for submitting your evidence, which is 30 days prior to the date of your scheduled FPM review. And so 
as we end this topic, I, I just want to mention for anyone else who is not selected for an FPM review, it's so important for you to know what evidence is required in the, in the instruments each year. So it's important that someone in your district, whether it's you or clerical staff, somebody physically compares um, the last year's to, to uh, instrument to the, to the new year's instrument so that you can note any changes because you'll have to adjust your your process or any you know maybe some uh, ways of doing things for the FPM or the implementation of your program. So it's important that you stay updated so that you can make sure that your systems are in place to implement the program corrective, correct and um, correctly, as well as collecting that evidence. And so it's important to annually train your the district and the school staff that's responsible for these programs. And so therefore, if you are selected, it's not a scramble, it's just a matter of gathering those items that are needed that reflect the implementation of your compliant programs. And that's it for federal program monitoring. And now Jeannie and team will continue with sharing on the LCAP update. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, this morning, our team is going to um, present on the topic of uh, increased or improved services and the connection to the metrics section. So going on to the next slide, thank you. Uh, we're sharing on this slide the LCAP instructions that address required metrics for contributing actions that are offered LEA-wide and the instructions for prompt one in the increased improved services section. And this is where LEAs provide descriptions required for each contributing action that are being provided either LEA-wide or school-wide. And so we specifically provide these components from the LCAP instructions together to highlight the connection between what is included in the metrics table and what is identified in prompt one in the increased or improved services section. Specifically, the metrics identified in the metrics table and those identified in the description in the increased or improved services section need to align. And the required metrics that you see included on the left-hand side of your screen are uh, a new requirement for contributing actions in the 24-25 LCAP. So we really want to call out how these two sections are connected. Um, they're specifically a through line between what you include in the measuring and reporting results table, as well as what you describe in the increased or improved services section. So on the uh, screen now, you see from our checklist, our pre-review checklist, two areas noted in the uh, increased or improved services section for prompt one. And so today we're going to highlight the required descriptions for prompt one, which is for LEA-wide and school-wide contributing actions. And also where you see the blue star, the additional requirement for districts to provide an explanation of how LEA-wide and school-wide contributing actions are the most effective use of the funds. And this requirement is included when LEA-wide or school-wide actions are being provided when there are lesser percentages of unduplicated pupils. And we'll provide um, some specific examples. And so for reference, these items are from the district pre-review checklist. And um, you may be aware that this pre-review checklist is also included in our LCAP uh, resources that are posted on our website. So going on to the next slide, 
This screenshot is from prompt one in the increased or improved services section. This is again where the LEA provides the required explanation for all LEA wide and or school wide contributing actions in, um, in the LCAP plan. So the instructions for the descriptions in this table really address the process the LEA used to first identify the needs, conditions, or circumstances of the specific unduplicated student groups through a needs assessment, and then how the action is designed to address these unique needs and a new component, a description of why the action is being provided either LEA-wide or school-wide. And then finally, the metric used to identify the effectiveness of the action. On the next slide, thank you. Our, um, our presentation, we've included a, a organizer that is going to align to some sample descriptions that highlight the components required. And so in the first column outlined in red, LEAs provide this explanation of the unique needs of the LEAs, unduplicated student group or groups for whom the action is principally directed. And an LEA demonstrates how the action is principally directed toward an unduplicated student group or groups when they explain needs, conditions, or circumstances of the unduplicated student group identified through a needs assessment. The instructions highlight for us that a meaningful needs assessment includes analysis of applicable student achievement data and educational partner feedback. In the second column outlined in orange, LEAs provide an explanation of how the action as designed will address the unique needs of the student group for whom the action is principally directed. And again, you see bolded this rationale why the action is provided on an LEA-wide or school-wide basis. And then the last column outlined in purple, the LEA identifies the metric that will use to measure the progress and effectiveness of the action. And this last column is where the LEA identifies a metric for the student group to whom the action is principally directed, as well as for all students. So I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the team and they're going to provide some samples. Awesome, good morning. Happy first day of the NFL draft. So now that Jeannie has given us a breakdown of how a wide contributing action is documented in the measuring and reporting results and increase or improve services tables, let's take a look at a couple of sample actions that we hope you'll find useful. We're gonna start with goal four, action one, and this is trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive environment. In the identify needs column, we can see that this district's needs assessment consisted of both analysis of student data and educational partner feedback. In the red highlighted text box, we can clearly see that our low-income students are struggling with chronic absenteeism and school connectedness. And in the orange text box, we can see that this district sought educational partner feedback through outreach with low-income parents, students, and their teachers. This sample action goes on to explain how this action is designed to address the needs of our low-income students and why it is being provided on an LEA-wide basis. Starting with the yellow highlighted text box, we see the classic who is doing what and for whom. As clinical social workers, we'll be providing social emotional support to our low-income students. And we also see that teachers will be receiving professional development to understand trauma, to create a safe and supportive environment for our low-income students. The justification as to why this action is being provided on an LEA-wide basis is seen here in the green highlighted text box, and it is because all students can benefit from the social emotional support to address mental health. The final requirement for wide contributing actions 
is for the LEA to identify one or more metrics to monitor the effectiveness of the action. In this sample, in the purple highlighted text box, the metrics to monitor effectiveness are written in a narrative form. This may be easier for our educational partners to understand the metrics that are actually being used. However, LEAs are not required to write narrative form as shown here. The requirement is to identify the metric. One way to do so, as you see here, is with the bold lettering inside the purple text box. Here, we have four metrics to measure effectiveness. So now let's take a look at them in the measuring and reporting results table. Here we have the four actions that we referred to in the increase and improve services section, but now we see them in the measuring and reporting results table. As you can see, each metric is numbered. It gives a source, CalPads, the dashboard, the truth survey. It gives a baseline with the year or the time period it was collected. And it also gives a target for year three outcome. It's important to note here that because our LEA wide action was principally directed for our low income students, our data has to be disaggregated to show our low income students compared to the all group. And of course, this table may also include, include excuse me, additional student groups. So in this next sample, we have two actions. Goal one, action five, which is reading specialists, and goal one, action six, after school literacy and arts. As you can see in the red text box, we have our analysis of student data, and in the orange text box, we address input from educational partners. In the yellow, we can see that the reading specialists will develop lesson plans with teachers to provide collaborative teaching and reading, and they will also provide parent trainings to support literacy at home, while the students participate in after-school programs that integrate literacy and the arts. The green text box addresses why this action will be provided on an LEA-wide basis, as all students and families can benefit from the support. And in the purple, we have our metrics to monitor effectiveness. Again, important to note here, you see three metrics that we will find in the metrics table, but we also have an evaluation form for uh, families and students. You might not see the evaluation form in the metrics table because that data may not be able to be disaggregated due to anonymity. So let's take a look at the metrics table. Again, here we have our three metrics and their respective sources. We have the percent of students meeting early literacy benchmarks in DIBBLES, the percent of students reading at grade level per iReady, and the distance from standard in grades three through five on the Smarter Balance Assessment or ELA. We also have our baseline data and when it was collected or when it will be collected and our target for year three outcome. Again, because this action was principally directed for low-income students, we clearly see the disaggregation of data to compare this unduplicated student group to the all student group. And now to add one additional and final requirement for select school districts, and to kind of synthesize all of this information that Jeannie and I have just shared, let's pass it over to Anita. Thank you and good morning, everyone. As Augustine mentioned, there is an additional requirement that must be addressed in the action description for school districts whose unduplicated pupil percentage is below a certain threshold. This additional requirement only pertains to school districts and not to charter schools. So if you are a school district with less than 55% unduplicated pupils, then for all LEA-wide actions, you must also describe how the LEA-wide action is the most effective use of funds and provide a basis for the determination with supporting research, experience or educational theory in the action description column. If a school-wide contributing action will be implemented at a school site within the district with less than 40% unduplicated pupils, then for all school-wide actions at that school site, you must do the same. Describe how the school-wide action is the most effective use of funds and provide a basis for determination with supporting research, experience, or educational theory in the action description column. So there are many requirements for contributing actions when completing the increased or improved services section. And the intent of this section is to provide educational partners with a comprehensive description of how your LEA plans to increase 
or improve services for all unduplicated students as compared to all students in grades TK through 12 as applicable to your LEA. Now, the intent of this diagram here is to help support you in writing an approvable description that includes the most effective use of funds for school districts with less than 55% unduplicated students and for school-wide actions implemented at school sites with less than 40% unduplicated student enrollment. As you can see here, in the Identify Needs column, you identify the unique needs of the unduplicated student groups for whom the action is principally directed. You also explain the needs, conditions, or circumstances of the student group or groups identified through the needs assessment. These two components are completed for all contributing actions. In the third column, the LEAs describe how the action, as designed, will address the unique need and provide an explanation or rationale as to why this action is principally directed for English learners, low-income students, and foster youth, but will be offered to all students. And now we get to the use of this diagram. As you can see in the first gray box, right below the blue star, the small blue star, school districts and school districts only must ask themselves a couple of questions and decide on next steps in this column. For LEA-wide actions, if your school district's unduplicated pupil percentage is less than 55%, then you must include additional information. Describe how this action or actions are the most effective use of funds and provide a basis for this determination with supporting research, experience, or educational theory. This requirement is noted with the large blue star and the blue text box at the bottom of the slide. Now, if your school district's unduplicated student percentage is 55 or greater, you do not need to include this additional information in the LEAY contributing action, and you can move to the last column where you identify a metric. Now, let's look at the second gray box. Similarly, for a school-wide action, if the school within the district where the contributing action will be implemented has an enrollment of less than 40% unduplicated student groups, then you will need to describe how this action or actions are the most effective use of funds and provide a basis for this determination with supporting research, experience, or educational theory. If the school where the school-wide action will be implemented has an unduplicated student percentage that is 40% or greater, then you do not need to include this additional information and you can move to the last column where you identify a metric. This sample is one we saw just a few, a few slides ago with Augustine, and these two actions aim to increase foundational literacy skills of elementary students with reading specialists, collaborative teaching, small group instruction, parent training, and after-school programs. All components, as previously pointed out by Janine and Augustine, remain. The additional rationale explaining why this wide action, school-wide or LEA-wide, is the most effective use of funds of supplemental and or concentration funds for all students is shown here in the second column, highlighted in blue. In this example, research is called out to demonstrate that there are studies that have not only proven the strategies in the action to be effective for low-income students and families, but to all who are included in the practice. Without a doubt, the increased or improved services section of the LCAP is a comprehensive component that truly supports LEAs in deep thinking that engages thoughtful reflection and analysis. It questions assumptions and beliefs, and it seeks out new information and perspectives in order to develop actions that purposefully increase or improve services for our low-income English learners and foster youth with the explicit intent of eliminating disparities of outcome for our students. Intentionality is key. Okay, and so now 
It's time for a check in on our understanding. And here is the question for the day and of this section. Your LCAP includes a contributing action that increases or improves a particular service across the entire LEA for low-income students and English learners. You've identified a metric for this contributing action. At the very least, how should the data for this metric be disaggregated in the measuring and reporting results section? A, for all students. B, every numerically significant student group in your district or LEA. C, low income and all students. D, low income and English learners. Or E, all students, low income and English learners. I wish we had like some Jeopardy music. Do, 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 do. I see great answers. Thank you for your participation. And if you answered E, give yourself a pat on the back. You are correct. At the very least, any LEA-wide or school-wide contributing action must identify a metric that is disaggregated by the all student group and the unduplicated student group or groups for whom the action is principally directed. And this ensures that when you determine the action's effectiveness next year around this time in the goal analysis section, round three, you will be able to determine if the action is increasingly improving outcomes for your unduplicated student groups as compared to all students. Once again, thank you for your participation and your attention. And next up, let's welcome Evan Bartelheim. Thank you, Anita. Um, so since school districts and charter schools are currently in the process of establishing their baseline metrics for the 2024-25 LCAP, and the language in ed code around the requirement to include summative assessments is maybe a little lacking in specificity. We thought it would be helpful to provide some clarification on the exclusive use of performance colors from the dashboard as a metric for academic performance. Next slide, please. So we had some some thoughts just uh, you know in looking into this um, as to why again exclusive use of the dashboard colors might pose a problem. Um, so first of all, the dashboard performance colors are less an, an objective standards-based measure of achievement and, and more like being graded on a curve and being compared against every LEA in the state. The performance standards or cut scores on each 5x5 five five performance grid are initially determined by evaluating the statewide distribution of all LEAs in the state across both status and change for each indicator um, and these are the results that are generated prior to its inclusion on the dashboard. That's because the dashboard was intended to not only inform parents, uh, educators, and others about each LEA's current performance and progress, but they were designed to help identify schools for additional assistance through both the differentiated assistance process as well as for federal uh, comprehensive support and improvement and uh, additional targeted support improvements so those kinds of placements. So, it's multifaceted. So the colors were really designed. And so you see that they're, we look at a distribution so we can identify the, the lowest performing schools. Additionally, performance colors aren't really an effective way of demonstrating whether an LEA is closing achievement gaps. Um, the colors are sensitive really to just one year changes in performance for individual student groups, but they aren't particularly effective at reflecting longer term closure of gaps between groups. Third, the performance standards um, or the colors for the the academic indicators are differ, different for each of the content areas, um, as well as by the grade level served. So grade spans three through eight have a different five by five grid than, than high schools do. Um, as a result, like, without the additional context that uh, distance from standard might, might give, um, the colors alone actually may be kind of, kind of misleading to educational partners. And finally, uh, while the performance standards for each indicator have generally remained fixed since they were uh, approved by the State Board of Education, they are still subject to review and revision. And we saw this a few years ago when they adopted a the balanced five by five for the academic indicator when they found that there was that small schools were being over-identified um, for small student groups on the academic indicator. So they can shift, right? So um, if you were to use exclusively colors for your performance, for your metrics, um, you could have a challenge if they were to shift uh, the cut scores within the three-year cycle of the LCAP. 
Next slide, please. So in addition to the reasons that I just shared, uh, a bigger issue to consider is that the dashboard performance colors may lack the precision to fully and transparently tell your story. And to make this point, I thought it might be helpful to provide an example. So let's, let's look at a hypothetical elementary school district um, and their performance of their two of their significant student groups on the math indicator. So the first student group um, is, is doing well. They, they're going to start with a baseline of green, right? And we're just talking green. And how that green was derived, they have a distance from standard of uh, one point above standard, a plus one distance from standard. And that's going to place them in the high category on the status column on the, on the left. And um, the prior year, let's just say that they maintained they've been in that category. Now, let's say that through, uh, uh, through actions, maybe emphasis on, on math, um, this student group grows 10 points per year, right? So the course, on, on average, they go three, 10 points for each consecutive year of the LCAP. So the end of the three years, um, the distance from standard overall would have been improved by 30, 30 points, right? That's pretty darn impressive. Um, however, uh, the, the distance from standard is going to be great. It's going to be plus 31, you know, 31 points from, from standard. That's still going to put them, though, in the high category as far as status is concerned. And because that final year they, they increased, they increased by 10, they're still a, a green. So it's tremendous color, they, but they've gone from green to green over the course of the LCAP. And not to say that green is bad, green is great, right? But let's just compare that to another student group. And the second student group, um, they start with a, a minus four. Not, not much lower, but they're minus four. And let's say for the first two years, they drop one point per year. And then in the final year, uh, they grow three points, right? So their net growth um, is only two points, right? They've gone, um, they've gone now to, a, they've got to a minus two, um, and so the or sorry minus three, which is putting them still in the medium category because they grew three points in the final year. Now they end up in the green category as well. So the net the difference between the two groups is pretty pretty large, right? So. Um, but they're both going to be green. So this is not to say that the growth that's uh, achieved in that final year wouldn't be helpful, but it really doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, it's probably not telling the whole story of the incredible increases that you would want to emphasize by sticking with green. This would be my big case. And then finally, if, if, if that difference or that difficulty in telling your data story with any kind of um, specificity is enough, I think there would just be that a very practical measure for not wanting to use colors, which is, um, tracking a color over the course of the three-year cycle and uh, understanding as a metric, um, not only would we have to know where we are with status that change each year and projecting where the growth would put you, it's a lot more challenging than just using something a lot more straightforward like distance from standard or if you're using um, the percentage of met or exceeded. So it is a local decision, but I just we just wanted to share some thoughts on why just using colors exclusively may not be uh, that effective. Thank you, Evan. And so looks like we're going to be giving you a gift of time. Um, we have some reminders. And so also too, as we have one more meeting next month, uh, we wanted to know if anyone is planning to share that they're planning to retire um, or if you would like to let us know privately, we'd love to know um, who, who is going to uh, start a new journey and adventure. So again, we um, if you can let us know if you're planning to retire, we would love to be able to celebrate you. So looking at the up, upcoming deadlines, um, there's a lot of fiscal deadlines right now, as well as um, others. So starting off with the federal cash management data collection, uh, the, re the reporting window is closing April 30th. Um, at 11.59. So please make sure that you're in, if you're not a fiscal person, if your fiscal person's not here, please make sure that you reach out to them and um, check in on them and see if everything's going to be okay for the, you know, to meet the deadline. Also, as Rachel shared, the consolidated application will be released um, May 1st with the uh, certification deadline of June 30th. And at that time, between June 30th and August 15th, what is um, what happens is then the CDE looks at all of those um, 
those reports. And if they have questions, then they're able to reach out to the district and charter and make sure that any um, adjustments or revisions that need to be made can be made before the system closes by August 15th. And then the CalPADS end of year report one, two, three, and four, the deadline is July 26. We also know that um, coming up too will be the local indicators and we'll have more information about that probably by May. And then the expanded learning opportunities program, again, the, de the expenditure deadline for the 21-22 and the 22-23 funding is June 30th and the Prop 28 arts and music in schools. Again, the annual report will be um, submitted by July 1st and then the annual certification. So again, we just wanna make sure that uh, as you're closing out the year and you know things are really busy uh, that you keep all of these deadlines um, on your calendar so that you're not um, you know, hit from behind when CDE you know, knocks on your door. So again, then um, this isn't a, an exhausted list, exhaustive list. So we wanna invite you again to our last meeting of this 23-24 school year on Thursday, May 23rd. Uh, from 10 to 11.30. Um, and so that's it for today. Again, if you have any questions, please place them in the chat and we'll we'll get to them. Also, we ask that you complete the evaluation for today's meeting and you can use the QR co code or you can look at the, uh, follow the link here. And so again, and also it's in the chat. So we, um, you know, definitely take a look at these. So we really appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. And since we're giving you the gift of time, I guess you have a little bit of time to fill it out. Um, and then next, you know, next meeting, we will be sending out a survey to kind of um, survey what kind of topics do you find most pertinent that you would like uh, for next year. And, you know, we typically ask, you know, do you prefer um, Zoom meetings or would you prefer in person or how, you know, and again, we usually, you know, we well, we do very thoughtfully look at these and we plan for next year. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're we're accommodating the majority and, you know, perhaps maybe we might be able to accommodate the minority as well. Uh, so here's our contact information. Please um, reach out to us either via email or phone and we will be able to um, help you out. So I believe that's it. So again, we want to thank you for joining us today and have a great weekend. And I guess we'll see you in May. And again, I hope somebody put in there that they're retiring. <laughs> All right. Thank you again for joining us.